Now it is our pleasure to introduce our last speakers for the day. Um, Ralph McDaniels and Elena Romero will be in conversation about styles and sounds, fat fashions, video music box, and the hip hop entrepreneur. Ralph McDaniels is the founder and the curator of Video Music Box, which airs on New York City NYC TV. McDaniels also, um, known as Uncle Ralph, has directed and produced over 400 music videos and co-produced the films Juice 1992 and You're Watching Video Music Box on Showtime in 2021. McDaniels' microphone is held in the collection of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Please join me in welcoming Ralph and Elena. Thank you. One, two, one, two. I want to give hey, a shout hey, out look, to- Hey, look, Elena, I wore my Tims just for this thing right here. And they dusty. <laughs> all right, so all of you may know Ralph as a music video director, DJ, VJ, but we also know him as sincerely Uncle Ralph with the longest running music video show in history. I'm hoping many of you caught his 2021 Showtime documentary, You're Watching Video Music Box. And later tonight, he will be hosting The Drip at the Hard Rock Hotel. So this conversation isn't so much about Ralph's legacy in music, but rather his love affair with fashion. So let's start first with how you fell in love with hip hop and where fashion came into play. I think the fashion probably was first. Um, because I'm just a little bit older than, than hip hop. I, we used to go to Delancey Street back in the days. So Delancey Street basically was like um, where you could get, like for $25, you could get like some jeans and two tops, you know, and it would be hot, you know. And so we, we couldn't get, I lived in, at the time in Queens, and we would go to Delancey Street, get off, and it'd be the latest whatever, Lee's and some type of uh, knit, Italian knit top, and maybe you could get, something else with that. But that was it, but it was quality, you know? And, and that was the thing, quality, you know? We, cause if, if my mother gave me some money or if I worked for it, I wanted to make sure that it lasts cause I don't know how, when the next time I might have a couple of dollars in my pocket. So I had to, you know, be creative with that, those jeans and be creative with those tops and make that work for, for, for months until I got something else to do. So yeah, so that was the beginning of it. Then when hip hop came, the first B-boy I ever saw was a guy named Jimmy Spicer from Brooklyn. He made this record and Mano redid it. Uh, dollar bill, y'all, dollar bill, y'all, dollar, 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 dollar bill, y'all. And so I knew his sister. And so I, she's like, my brother's a rapper. And I was like, okay. And so she... <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, I'm like, what am I, what am I doing right now? So she's coming down the, he's coming down the block, and he was like a hard rock. His hat was to the side, his pants were down here, and he had pumas with fat laces on. And I was like, oh, he's definitely different. You know, like his whole body, his whole persona was a different vibe. And she was like, hey, you know, she didn't even call him by his rap name, whatever the brother and sister name that she called him. And he looked at me like, who are you? And I was like, What's up, bro? You know, just chilling, <laughs> nothing going on. Just we just talking. We just talking. <laughs> and then and I, but and then I realized that 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 was Jimmy Spicer, and I was like, wow, that was amazing, you know. And the crazy story about Jimmy Spicer is Jimmy Spicer passed away two years ago of cancer, and I raised money for Jimmy Spicer, you know, when he was in chemo, going through chemo, and. Um, that's how much he meant to me, and that's what how much people in the hip hop, you know, business culture mean to each other. You know, like I was like, it was my responsibility to do something, whatever I could do for Jimmy Spicer. That was literally the first b boy I ever saw. So anyway. Yeah. Oh wow. So talk to us about Video Music Box. How did it get started, and where did fashion fall into place? 
So Video Music Box started in 1983. 1983 was a very cool time. You know, there was culture, there was money going into culture and arts, you know, for whatever reason. So you had my TV show, you had radio stations that were starting. Red Alert started at the same time on 98.7 KISS. Um, fashion shows are happening downtown. You know, like, to me, there was nothing else important if it wasn't below 14th Street. Like, everything had to be below 14th Street. Like. <laughs> If it was in the village, if it was going to these clubs, you know, there was, you know, everything was 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 creative under 14th Street. And so, if, if somebody said they was having a part, like if like this, it was on 27th Street, I'd be like, no, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's not it's not gonna be right. If it was on 13th Street, I'm going. <laughs> so so you know so that was and this was for kids that were coming from like myself coming from Brooklyn and coming from Queens and the kids from the Bronx, and that's when hip hop uh, goes into the Roxy's um, and Bambada's doing a night there, playing DJing and doing a, a, a night there. And, um, and Run DMC is going to uh, you know some of these other clubs and we, we hanging out with punk rockers. We're not really hanging out with them. We are around punk rockers. <laughs> we didn't get along, but we were bo all you know misfits. You know, like the hip hop guys and the punk rock guys cannot come in my club. That's what, because this was disco times. Oh. If you didn't look like John Travolta, <laughs> no. Just that spike hair is not happening. And them, 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 what are they wear? The boots, the, uh, them, them boots that the punk rock kids wear? Doc Martens. That was not <laughs> happening. And then these, the rapper dudes with the Adidas and their hats to the back, not gonna happen. So we both were kicked out, couldn't come. But we didn't talk to each other because we wasn't into punk rock music and they wasn't into hip hop music. But we did have something in common and we understood each other that we wanted to be, we deserved to be inside, mm -hmm. just like everybody else. So that much we knew. And so that was the thing about, about hip hop and punk rock. And both of those styles were very um, influential, very influential around the country and around the world. Um, when we went to London, we saw kids that looked just like us. And I was like, oh, they want to look like what we look like in New York City? Oh, OK, that's cool. And then when we went to Africa, they, they were kids that looked, because you knew they came looking at the party, or they came to the concert, and they looked just like us. And I was like, New York is really influential. If we knew how much influence we have on the rest of the world, mm -hmm. we would be take it way more serious. Let's put it that way. We would take it way more serious. So what was early hip hop style in the beginning and how has that evolved and changed and how you see it today? I mean, I'm an OG. There's this cast that came way before me. <laughs> but, you know, um, it's, it's casual. At least, okay, this is the other, another thing too, right? So Brooklyn has a thing. The Bronx has a thing. Anybody from the Bronx in here? Anybody from Brooklyn in here? Brooklyn. See, see the difference? <laughs> <laughs> See the and then you got Queens and you got Staten Island and you got Uptown Harlem and you got we cannot forget about the Lower East Side because Lower yes. East Side was a big contributor to hip hop and the culture so you got all Long of these Island. collections yes we have all of these collectives in these different pockets of the city and we can't forget about Brick City and Newark and, 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 and all of these areas it's all together you know, we're all here together. And everybody has their own little piece that they bring to it. And I don't remember the question, but I know that each area had its own style. Let's, let's put it like that. So what would you say Brooklyn's early style looked like? Brooklyn looks like Wallabies, Clarks. Anybody know Clarks are? Yeah, Clark. um, Clarks. Um, maybe some type of custom-made um, shark skin pants. Dead ass, and <laughs> and and you could get them customized. I used to have my initials over here by my pocket because it was cheap. He like he was like, let me get those three letters. Like a, it was like a dollar a letter maybe, and he'd put it there. Boom, and then you would have um um what's the the uh, the quarterfields quarterfields, yeah, with suede, and then you might, the hats was a big thing in Brooklyn. We love hats. And um, and a knit, you know. So when you look at Jamel Shabazz's photographs, mm -hmm. if you just Google him, 
He has a book out called Before Crack. And that was before crack hit our community. Mm-hmm. Everybody was looking good. And then crack hit and literally wiped out a whole community, you know. Um, and nobody knew. It was like a war was going on and you had no idea. Like it was doctors, lawyers, middle class communities that were coming up that were doing well. And because they had money, they were the first to go. Because crack didn't, you know, it had no, no, no discrimination. Mm-hmm. It just wiped you out. You were smart as hell, but all of a sudden you didn't have it. But out of that, we have a, a, a community that's happening right here. So a lot of us are coming into the city and we're going to the gay clubs where you see the dancers. The same dancers that you saw at the B-Boy spot, they're in the Paradise Garage. Paradise Garage has the best sound system in the world. We're going there because if you love music and you want to hear it in a club, and on Saturday night is gay night, Friday night is, is, is straight night, whatever that means. So, <laughs> so because it was all the same. <laughs> and so, so that was for me back then. I'd be like, I'm going to straight night. I'm not going to gay night. So, you know, but this is what, you know, this is what we did. And it made it fun. And you saw the dances and you saw the people and you saw the fashion and you saw the clothes and you saw the hair and you saw everybody doing something different and not afraid. Because when I went back to my block in Queens at the time, wasn't nobody doing that. No, we not, no, stop playing. Do not call him our hair, bro. We're not doing nothing funny style with the laces. <laughs> None of that. Strict. You buy you wear it how you bought it. So you talked a lot about Brooklyn. What was Queens style like? Queens was real conservative. But Queens was about getting money. See, Queens is about business. Like we figure out how to make money out of it. Like if we sitting there looking at these jeans and y'all wearing these outfits and stuff. Okay, so we need to open a store because this is hot, this is hot. (laughs) And where do they buy this stuff at? So we got to open up a store. So I opened up a store called Uncle Ralph's Urban Gear in 1990 or something like that. And because this was just because FUBU had clothes that they were giving to me. me. Cork and I was giving me clothes. Um, Anybody, Sean John, Hilfiger, whoever was. And I was like, where can you buy this? Believe it or not, Macy's did not carry any of these clothes. And I was like, how come they don't have it in Macy's? It's like, <laughs> basically it was racism. They didn't want that. They didn't want that customer coming into Macy's. They didn't want that customer coming into Bloomingdale. They didn't say that. They was like, make it very difficult for you to go jump over hoops to get into Macy's and to get into um, these, these, these stores. And, and a guy like me was like, oh, there's an opportunity. Let me open up a store and call all my friends and see if I can get them to put their clothes in my store. And then came bootlegging. And bootlegging put me out of business. Oh, no. Because I'm selling the the official Carl Canai outfit with everything for whatever Carl is saying. It's $50 or $60. And the guy, the bootlegger's right next door selling it for $20. And I'm like, yo, get out of here, man. And he's like, "Uh," you know. I'm trying to get a, trying to make a living. And I'm like, yo, there's a dude selling the same stuff the, that we're selling, but it's the bootleg version. And so we had to deal with the bootlegger. Then Macy saw that this stuff was selling, and we're going to put it in our store. And we're going to buy way more than Ralph, Uncle Ralph can buy, and, I'm, and, and, we have, and we have credit. So that's when I got out of the retail business, because I was, I was getting squeezed by the bootlegger, and... <laughs> Confe- you know, uh, federation, and it was like, all right, this, I can't win here. So that was also the beginning of online buying online. That's when, way before, the, that was way before, you know, the, um, the internet. It was like people were like creating ways that you could get it somehow online delivered to you in some way. So we covered Brooklyn and Queens. What about the Bronx? BX is hard. BX, you can't play. BX is straight. <laughs> no, no BS. You got to come hard. Um, yeah, you know, come hard or go home. You know, big coats, you know, um, 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 the, the fat farm, remember the big fat farm, um, bombers? That's the first time I saw them in all colors. You know, dudes in the Bronx. You know, I'm like, it's not even snowing and y'all wearing bombers, <laughs> you know? And, but it was a vibe, you know, it was just a look. And, um, and yeah, and, 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 and sweaters, you know, you know, 
the other thing too is the Caribbean community. Anybody from the Caribbean in here? Yeah. So if you from the Caribbean, you grew up in Brooklyn in the Bronx, and um, and yes, Flatbush, see. And so <laughs> there's an influence, not just in the music, in the clothing, uh -huh. because Caribbean people dress. When you go to a straight dance, you know, like back in the days when Shaba people used to get custom outfits made and. Uh, you know, it, linen. linen, there you go. And so linen was a big thing. And so if you grew up in this area, you're influenced by, I can look in this room and see the, the, the influence of Caribbean and, and uh, cultural, you know, that, that culture in our, in our sound and in our clothes, just by looking through the room, you know. And this is a, 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 a old eyes looking at it, you know, but I can still see it and I know when I see it, you know. So, and we don't really get the credit, the Caribbean, Designers don't get the credit for what they've done, but they've been there all along. In fact, they were been they were there probably before African Americans were. They were doing it, and they were doing like if you go back to Grace Jones, you know, and you go back to to other artists, they were the people that were. My cousin, my mother's first cousin, is Jeffrey Holder, amazing, you know, uh, actor and and um, sculptor and playwright and all these things. Anything if you're looking at like like uh, culture in the, in, the, in the flesh. When he walked in the room, was, this was it. He was like, and he's from Trinidad. So he had this deep Trinidadian accent, and he's dancing, and, he, and we used to sit there and go like, okay, he's like real, this is the real deal. But all of that brought the design, the amazing designers, amazing um, artists that, you know, that drew people that made things like this. I used to be like, I didn't even know I could make a, a table. I can make a chair? Like, I just thought that, you know, it was just came out of a factory. We can do that too. You know, I, there's a show that Tyler the Creator has on, 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 I think it's on Vice. And I used to be like, I like this kid. He's making chairs. He's making tables. You know, he's making beds. Like, that's what we need to be doing. You know, like, that's really where this, we, if we can, make a, a hoodie or make a jacket or make some, some shoes. We can do all of that. We can design this, this space right here, you know? That's what it's all about. What about Harlem sweater? Harlem beats everybody. I can't front. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't gonna front. Well, yeah, Brooklyn, we do our thing, but that Harlem thing is a little different. I ain't gonna front. It's a little different. It's a little different. Um, yeah, just taking chances in a, in, a, in, a, in a clear way. Like it was clear, like it was, you knew that person thought that through when they woke up. You know, Brooklyn, we kind of mix it up sometimes and you know, in other areas, but Bron I mean, um, Harlem, when I'm not, you know, creative, I'll just walk down 125th Street and I'll be, on I'll be back on track by the time I get from one avenue to the other. There seems to be a lot of misconception that hip hop is just jeans. Where does tailored clothing and furs come in? Um, street life, yeah, street life. You know, like when you look at cats that were drug dealers or you look at just hustlers in general, you know, they wanted to um, stand out. And, um, and that's what we saw, you know, that was, you know, LL used to chase behind, you know, Alpo and them guys up in Harlem. Like, cause he just looked, loved the way they looked. You know, like, this is amazing. Those are Harlem guys, you know? He knew that if I can just get a little bit of that style in me, I'll become popular. And, and, and the guys in Harlem will tell you that all the time. He said, man, LL used to be up here jocking our style all the time. But, you know, I'm not mad at him. That's what he, 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 he strove to be the best he could be. And so he took a little bit of Harlem, he took a little bit of Queen, took a little bit of Brooklyn, and he's one of the biggest stars in, out of hip hop that we have, you know? And, still continues to go and break down new grounds every day. So that's how powerful the streets are, you know. Um, I've heard Jim Jones and Jewel L. Santana say, you know, like, we start it. We start everything. We start the trends, you know, like not just in a record, but they say it like for real, you know, because the kids see it. It starts out, you know, with some, some creative young men and women. And next thing you know, it's, in Paris, you know, it's in, it's, it's Gucci copying, copying now Dapper Dan. Like, how's that possible? That Gucci's, the same thing that you're locked Dapper Dan up, 
with the bootleggers, now you're doing it and, 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 and selling it for a crazy amount of money. What about the low lives and the story of Polo? So I'm, in Brooklyn, I used to take the train, and there was these guys called the low lives. And they're like, they're basically harass you. And, and if, you, if you have on something nice, like if, let's say there was a guy here, he had a chain on, like a real chain, like, and no low lives on the train, they're taking that chain off your neck. And so um, low lives were into polo. That's why I say low. And, um, and they would run through the stores and just take, yeah, boosting, right. And, um, and I really wasn't into polo. That's the funny thing. Like, so I didn't really get it at first. But there was a guy named Thurston Howell III. And Thurston Howell was one of them, right? And Thurston Howell was also a rap artist, which made, gave them commercialism. Mm. And so you would see his videos, and then all of these guys were there with, the, with Low on. And the thing about Low and, 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 and Hill figure, really Low, is that he's got seasonal gear. Like every season, there's an outfit. You know, I'm talking about head to toe, socks, jeans, hat, whatever it is, summer, spring, fall, winter, holiday, <laughs> New Year's, a whole outfit, like with, the, with, the, with this, with the couch and the chairs, you can buy that too. And the carpet <laughs> and on the, the floor. Bedding. And the bedding. The whole thing. <laughs> and the outfit for the dog. So that's why they love, because the detail of Ralph Lauren is amazing, amazing. So let's talk about early music videos and the role that stylists now have. What were early music videos and wardrobe like? So early music videos, there was no stylist. That wasn't even a line item. Like who, what, a stylist, for what's that? It was, a, I, the, the artist would go, I want to go to, you know, whatever, whatever the cool store was and buy some, some clothes. And so we would give them, physically give them money in their hand and they would go with their friends and they would buy clothes. There was no stylist. And then um, the record labels started to get involved. So as, as it becomes more hip hop artists, it becomes more competitive. So if Nas is wearing some crazy, like cool stuff, Jay-Z's like, I gotta look better than Nas, but I don't know where to buy that, where Nas got that at, where did that come from? So now there's a stylist. And then there's that one person that can find everything. And that person becomes the stylist. June Ambrose type person, right? right. June Ambrose come, starts with us. She's from out of hip hop. She's a dancer. She danced in videos that I did. She's a B-girl, for real. Yes. And so June is like, no problem. I know where to find everything. June is that girl. And so she immediately rises to the top. And she's part of the culture, so it's cool. You know, you're not worried about June, because the culture is tight. We, it's not really like, you know, something that we just like let anybody in freely. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's like, who is that? Like, what is that? What's going we'll on? We'll get people to co-sign. <laughs> we'll pick up the phone and be like, you know so-and-so? Right. Are they legit? Yeah, you know, so, um, so, so now there's the stylist. And the stylist is coming in and they're bringing in different things that you might not know where to buy, but they find it. And, um, and so that's how, um, you know, it became a whole lifestyle for people. You know, I did Whitney Houston videos. And I did, I've done like big R&B artists, like huge budget. The stylist made more money than me and I was the director. Mm. What did those numbers look like? We want to know. I mean, you talking about in the early 2000s. So this was like, this is almost 20 years, 25 years ago. So this is like, maybe that person, let's say I was making 20 grand as a director for that particular job. That person might have been making 35,000. That was back then. High end. And today? I don't know. June Ambrose is rich. I don't know. She <laughs> making more money than anybody. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about fashion shows. What made you decide to launch Fat Fashions? So Fat Fashion was a show that I started, like P-H-A-T, was a show that I started in the in the early uh, 90s, 92, 93. And I was like, yo, the, the fashion week didn't allow, once again, urban designers to be in it, unless you were doing couture or ready to wear or something, something else. And urban, 
if it had that name on it, was definitely not allowed in Fashion Week. Only way you could get into Fashion Week is if you paid a lot of money. So Russell Simmons probably was the only person that could do that because he had all this record company money. And he said, well, I got money, and he threw the money on the table. In Fashion Week, people took the money, and he was in the show. So he bought his way in, but not everybody had it like that. You know, FUBU didn't have it. Like, FUBU hasn't broke yet, didn't take off. Um, Carl is, Kanai is not doing it yet. April Walker can't do it yet. All these different people. Sean John is not even, a, it's not nothing yet. And so they just want to be involved. They just want a fair shot. And so none of these artists, none of these um, designers can get in the show. Um, and I just didn't understand it. Me and you had conversations around that time. Yeah. You were writing, you were writer, writing about what was happening, this new emerging scene of hip hop and, 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 and clothing and folks being, breaking new, new, uh, new walls, that, breaking down walls and getting into certain stores and all this other stuff. And I was like, yeah. And, but there was no show mm -hmm. in New York where you could go see these people. And so I created this show called The Fat Fashion Show. And it was at, in Times Square at this place called The Supper Club. And the first time we did it, the designers were so happy. Like, I didn't know that they were, you know, I thought, I don't know, I had an image, because fashion is so flamboyant, fabulous. Like, I had an image that they were just doing big things all the time. And they were like, no, we're not. We needed some place to, to do our thing and walk and, and do it in our way and be unapologetically what we are. And I was like, let's do it. So we, we, we set up a show and we started doing it and it was amazing. And, you know, it's kind of like what we're doing tonight. It's like just expressing yourself in your own way and however you want to do it and not having to fit into what people want you to do. And that part is, um, is cool. I think that that's just like the music. We, you know, we want to make music that we want to make, fashion. It wasn't always like this, how it is today. That's all I can say. It's, 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 I don't know how to tell, and you know, you know, my 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 daughter, you know, like, it wasn't like this. It was like, it, we were so happy to have a place that would even allow us to come in, like we sitting in here right now. Mm -hmm. They were like, nope, can't have nothing black. Too many black people, can't do it. And, and most people look at me, why would they do that? I don't know, but they did it. And today, we don't have to deal with that, but sometimes we do. And, and you know, we move forward and we move on, but the fat fashion gave people an opportunity to just be themselves and be free and express themselves. And then I started seeing, like, Mariah Carey came. And they were like, Ralph, Mariah Carey's here. I was like, really? Oh, Mary J. Blige is here. Really? All these people started just showing up. And I was like, and I didn't invite them or anything. They just heard about it. And I was like, All right, we hot, we hot out here, you know? <laughs> and so, and that's, but that was the culture, you know, and people enjoy that. And, you know, sometimes we have to, you know, we create our own culture. There's subcultures of hip hop or subcultures of, of fashion that exist. And, and that's okay. Do whatever you do to protect your wellness. And we just want to be well. That's all we want to be well, and we want to be whole and do what the fuck we want to do. So on the heels of hip hop turning 50, why return to the runway? Because that's what we do. It's, you know, they want to walk. They want to be fabulous. They want to be fly. They want to be fresh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, you know, um, it's amazing. Uh, today, I just came from this event with um, Grandmaster Flash, Roxanne Shante, uh, Milk D, Special Ed, and Rakim. Mm. And tonight, they're going to turn the Empire State Building red, black, and green in honor of Hip Hop 50 and Black History Month. And we got a good award. Mm. And, you know, me and Rakim is like, they wouldn't even let us come up in the building back in the <laughs> days. It's an honor to be, you know, like it's just like it's like old New York to me, like the Empire State Building. It's like, like we take it for granted. Like people talk about it, the Empire State. But you know, like when I was a kid, my grandmother used to go, okay, we're going on a trip to the to Manhattan. And we're going to the Empire State Building. Like that was a, a trip. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we'd have to be on our best behavior because she would knock you out, you know? <laughs> So you be walking, don't get too far in front of me. Don't laugh too much, stop playing. Stop, the, oh this is what Caribbean people, stop that horse playing. <laughs> we didn't do nothing. 
but that was a trip. So the Empire State Building, you, you know, like that's a big, like I was like, I wish my mother was here to see that I'm getting an award with my name on it that looks like a miniature Empire State Building in the Empire State Building because that's old New York, you know? You know, it, it, you know, when you start thinking through it, does it really mean anything? You're like, mm, I don't know. But for me, being an OG and just thinking about growing up and looking at it, and you know, I, it was, it was, it was cool. It was cool, a cool thing to do today. That was cool. I mean, it was wonderful to see Rakim perform for DAP last night yes. at the shop at Mark Jacobs for a fire chat for uh, LVMH, and we were talking about that as well. That's um, iconic. If, if you know Dap knows that paid in full cover with Eric B and Rakim on it, what? <laughs> That's hip hop in the flesh right there. One last question, and it's a bit uh, you know self-deserving. What is the museum doing a hip hop style exhibition? What does that mean in the grand scheme of things? Um, they have to do it. I mean, they one of the things that happened. This is also a Dapper Dan story is that Dapper Dan came to the museum. This is the Universal Hip Hop Museum, opens up late 2024. And Dapper Dan, I saw um, my good friend Martha Diaz here. And, and, and by the way, it wasn't just black people, it was Latino people, it was Caribbean people, it was people from all over the culture that made hip hop. Let's be clear on that, right? And so, <clears throat> Dapper Dan came to the museum and he, um, he saw an outfit that he made for Ultra Magnetic MCs, and there's another one in that, I don't remember the other one, Martha probably know better than me because she's the archivist. But he hadn't seen, because Dapper Dan would just make these things and sell it. So he didn't see it, like it's not like he held on it like, or he had 10 pieces of it, it was one on one. And he made it, sold it, and you came and picked it up and it was gone. So he's, we have pieces, or the museum has pieces that are one of ones that Dapper Dan created that he hasn't seen since he put it in Rakim's hands or put it in Cool Keep's hands or whoever it was. So that's what the museum is about. That's why the museum is important. If somebody's sitting with this stuff in their basement or in their garage or wherever, put it in the museum, put your name on it, and say it was donated from you know, the Jones family on 233rd. Whatever it is, it sounds like some cool shit to do. So you can come back and your kids and your aunties and them can go, we, we donated that, you know, do that. I mean, you right here, right across the street. Amazing stuff. This lady was like knocking down my door. You know, like, yo, I know you got some stuff in there, Ralph. And I was like. And he was holding out. He took out a couple of things when Liz and I went to his home. He allowed, his wife and him allowed us to come in. And he just had a few things on the sofa. By the time we finished our visit, the sofa was completely overflowing. His wife was like. I've got some things I've got to take out of storage. Oh, Let Lord. me see what else we have. And he kept going and was like, oh, wait, I got to also show you this. I got to show you that. <laughs> Once we got going, you know, I knew I was, in, I was, I was safe, you know, because that's the whole thing. We want to be protected. We want to be around people that we can trust. And I know Elena got my back, so I'm good. All right. With mm -hmm. that being said, thank you, Ralph. We thank look you. forward to the drip tonight. Yes. Thank you. guys stay right there. We're going to invite Vicky onto stage. Unfortunately, not all of our speakers could stay with us for Q&A, but if you guys have Q&A, please, um, there's a microphone here, there's a microphone up there, please ask a question. Vicky comes to take a seat, and there should be a mic for you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Any? Don't be, don't be shy. I have a yes. Uh, yes, please go to the mic. Um, that way that we'll pick it up on the camera, on the video. Hi, my name is Kenny Smith. I represent Northside, Southside, Jamaica, Queens. Oh. I grew up on Video Music Box. And uh, when I f f learned about hip hop, it wasn't just only music. It was also television, like a different world. The Cosby, um, you know, a bunch of different shows. So they interjected hip hop in so many different cultures and aspects that, you know, it was full circle, opposed to just the music. It was like um, Fresh Prince of Bel Air, 
and it just kept going on and on. So, you know, I just want to know, did video music about play a major role in, um, you know, any of this? Um, I think so, you know, because when we first came out, there wasn't no sitcoms as much. Correct. Um, and we showed some people that they, this could work, like that black people have value or the, the kids in, in the inner city have value. Because that's all I wanted to do was show kids not up to, like I, I say in my documentary, before Video Music Box, everybody time I saw a young black male, he was being pushed in a cop car with his head down. And we were showing people like standing up, talking with a tie on, like having a conversation. And that gave a whole different image to TV is a broad uh, division. It showed a different black person on TV when Video Music Box came on. So I think it did. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Anae Sai. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio, but I've um, been living in New York for like over like 10 years now. And the thing that attracted me to New York was, was the culture, was the hip hop, was Mary and all the music and all that. And even since I've been here, I feel like it's, it's kind of escaping that energy, that, that, that grittiness um, that um, was the foundation. I don't see it, I don't feel it as much. I'm, I'm wondering what is your opinion on that? And I'm wondering should that, the thing that maybe uh, made it kind of disappear or should it be explored? Is it worth exploring like what happened to the yeah. culture of New York a little bit? Is Absolutely, yeah. I feel the same way you feel. <laughs> I feel like, you know, when I walk around, I don't feel like that New York you know, I think that a whole bunch of people got paid. <laughs> and once you got money and you got that job, you stop being creative and you stop being edgy. Like our whole idea, our whole being was to be edgy. My friend Martha, we, we, whatever we did, you had to be edge. You know, it can't be just regular. We'd be like, that's corny. Don't do that, you know? So now, because it's corporate and you gotta be woke, you gotta be, you gotta be careful you know, and you do, you, I, I think it's good, but we still gotta be creative and we still can do things and we gotta be making, sh we have to make sure that we, we inspire and, 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 and that's what gets me excited. Like I said, when I'm, you know, kind of stuck, I go to Harlem or I go to certain areas that I know there's gonna be some cool people around and I can go like, okay, I got it, I'm back. You know, that quick, you know, but you're right. You know, I, you know who got it right now? Atlanta. Yep. When I go to Atlanta, and when, especially when I see, you know, African Americans and different folks in the urban community, it looks like what I see on TV. So when I'm looking at TV, and it looks like it, Atlanta, where TV used to look like New York, now TV looks like Atlanta. So that's what's happening. I mean, it, you know, I'm not in control of that, but that's what happens. We could get it back, though. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I know that we have a question here, but if there are any other questions, please feel free to make your way to the microphones on this side or this side. But I know you have a question. First, thank you, Uncle Ralph, for what you've done for our culture and just bringing Video Music Box to our television for many years, even till today. Um, part of my question is, growing up on Video Music Box and seeing like the latest videos and what's coming out from the clubs and how videos just played a major role in our culture of hip hop. I noticed that it has gone away a little bit. We don't really have the video culture anymore from BET, from MTV, and that's been a big miss for even stylists, for brands, for any opportunities for fashion to live in front of us in movement other than being on social media. Do you see an opportunity for that to come back to the culture of hip hop? Yeah, I think that the, the artists and people in the culture want that. They want it to come back. I had the same conversation with Jim Jones. Jim Jones was shooting a video. He was directing a video um, for DJ Drama and, and had Queen Latifah in the video. Then I was like, he was like, we got Queen Latifah. I was like, Queen Latifah ain't there. So I come there, she's standing right there. 
This was right after the Grammys. And I was like this, like, what up? So this is, oh, wow, Grand Poobah, a brand newbie and step, stepped in the building. <laughs> And so um, we, um, I'm, I want to make sure I get back on point with, the, with, your, with, your, with your point. Videos. We need videos to, to give you a job, to give people in here at FIT who do this, you know, like they want a career out of this to get, to get a job. Because what happens is that video directors and, and stylists and lighting and people who make clothes, they, they get lost in the shuffle once it gets high. Once the money gets bigger, you're gonna see less of us because it's money. And they're gonna be like, nope, we're gonna give it to my friends over here, this company and that company, and there's gonna be less of us. When we first started doing music videos, I, would, I could have a conversation with Poobah and say, yo man, you know, we're gonna, I wanna try this, I wanna try this, and go, all right man, no problem. He's a perfect example, him and guys like Tupac. I'm going to look out for my people. I'm going to give you an opportunity. Don't hit me in the head with no prices, but I'll give you an opportunity and do your thing. And that's what we don't have sometimes. I'm not going to say it's, not totally, it's totally out of the picture, but as the, the business becomes bigger, you're going to see less people that look like you. Because there were people that were doing this in rock and roll first. And they were making money. Then rock and roll started to go down, and hip hop started to go up. And the same people that was in rock and roll came over to hip hop. They wasn't here because they loved hip hop. They was here for the money. That's why they came. We have a question up top. Dun, 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 dun. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Uncle Ralph. First and foremost, you know. Thank you. Now, when I'm looking at everything that you originated and then you had Fab Five come with Yo MTV Raps, and then you had Rap City, The Basement, and all of these things that came after that. Big Tigger. I, I hear you mention how you started video directing, but did you take all of these different opportunities that came for video on TV as accolades, as an acknowledgement of what you originated, or did you feel like there was some type of a slight? Um. No, nah, I think that I believe in the world is going to progress. I'm not going to think that it's going to progress in a way that I can control it. It's going to do whatever it does. And you just have to be aware and be present all the time. And as things start to change, if you want to be part of it, you should be moving along with it. Sometimes I don't want to be part of it. <laughs> I'm like, I'm good. Y'all go ahead and do that. So <laughs> make my little, little time go by, and I just might you know, start building cars over here for a little while. I'm going to do something else while y'all do that. And, and, and that's cool because, you know, you don't have to be, a, you know, a slave to, to, to this business because that's a problem. You know, there's, I look at people that have been around this business for a long time. They look like, they look tired. It's a, it's a drain to be part of this all the time. This, this clothing thing here, this fashion thing, and trying to keep up with that, you know, that European monster, you know, doing whatever they doing. And we New York, we could c create some shit that's just some dope fly shit and y'all will be stuck on it for the next 30 years. We, that's what we do. <laughs> you know, we ain't got to, you know, we don't got to do that. You know, I, I think that that's what this young lady from Ohio was saying, that we just had, we could just watch this. It'd be the next big thing tomorrow. And I'll think of it today. But... Now it's a little different. You have social media. So there's some person sitting in their house, and they say they're in New York, and they might be, you know, in, in Maine because they got a fake background behind them. It's, so, it's crazy. You know, the world is crazy right now. And so you got to be, and you got to compete with that. You got to compete with that. So pray on it, brother. Pray on it. Like... So we have time for one last question, and we have... Uh... Someone waiting here. I'll go for it. Tustin, Tustin. Uncle Ralph, thank you very much. How are you doing? Uh, my name is Jeffrey. I, I teach fashion styling actually here at FIT. Uh, you can clap for that. You know, yeah. the home, yeah. Homegrown, homegrown. Uh, we had a chance to connect at the 1792 event. Okay, that's what I was going to say. Yeah. 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 Uh, I had some students there um, as well. So when we talk about like some of the newer generation, a lot of my students 
their first time um, learning about Video Music Box and even uh, about the history of hip hop is from the documentary that you and your brother Nas produced, who coincidentally has a show tonight, so I don't know which one I'm gonna go to. <laughs> uh, so in, in reference to creating those type of bodies of work, what else would you be working on at this time to put something on a bigger screen uh, for hip hop for the wider audiences, if any? I think we should be in every space. You know, I do a, uh, actually just started today, uh, a collection of um, museums, libraries, and archives. And we have 40 collaborators across the country, from Compton Library to Brooklyn Public Library to Queens Library to- To the Museum of FIT. To the Museum at FIT. And because all of these spaces have collections and have of information. Um, Martha Diaz is a, a archivist, you know, like she, she'll tell you if you're an archivist and you'd be like, I'm an archivist, no you're not. <laughs> she'll tell you that, right? You know, and there, are, there are hundreds and thousands of people just like her that are super smart and that they will break down why things happen the way they do, especially as we celebrate Hip Hop 50. And so um, that is a, is, is, it's never happened before. There's, you know, we've had, you know, we st I think Martha was the first person I know that kind of started getting people together. And now I meet all of these folks that are 30 years old that are archivists. And I'll be like, oh, you know, and they talk like Martha. They be having that certain <laughs> code language they be talking, you know? And I'll be like this, like, okay, yeah, this is real. So. To have that across the country, we got the Trap Trap Museum in 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 Atlanta. You know, like that's that's a real museum. Like, go check it out. It's, it's dope. You know, and so we in a different time. You know, so this is y'all generation, y'all. I mean, we did some work to get y'all get here. So have fun with it, and then the next, just pass it on to somebody else. That that's that's what this is all about. Because you ain't gonna be here forever. So. Have fun with it. I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank each and every one of you for joining us this afternoon. But please give another round of applause for our amazing speakers in the morning and in the afternoon. If you have not seen the exhibition yet, it is open across the street, across, directly across 27th Street until 8 p.m. tonight. Um, but thank you again for joining us today.